Hello class, today I'm looking forward to talking to you about Chapter 10, Managing Careers. I'd like to start by talking about the current career paradigm, and I think that is based on self-reliance and proactivity. Uh, after World War II, America was fairly dominant in the uh, world economy because some of our biggest competitors had been brought to their knees through the destruction of World War II and so there was a long period from about 19 from the 1940s till about 1973 where things were relatively stable in the US in terms of employment and there was quite a bit more job security than there is today and those days as you well know probably better than I do are largely over so the uh, self-reliance you can't really expect a company to take care of you for life anymore you kind of have to be watching out for yourself career-wise and um, retirement-wise. And then also the proactivity. You've got to be like a cat in today's economy, ready to land on your feet if you fall. In other words, if your company uh, does poorly and has to downsize or closes up altogether, you really kind of always got to be thinking of two things. One, how can I do a good job at my current job and maintain a good standing here? And then secondly, what am I doing to build my skills and make sure that I stay marketable if and when something happens with this position? So not necessarily a nervous or um, high uncertainty mindset, but just a realistic attitude that I need to perform my job well here to ensure that if there is a downsizing, I'll be seen as a valuable employee that the organization will want to keep. But I also need to keep building my skills, keep building my network, uh, documenting my skills and abilities through my resume and other means that will help me land on my feet, so to speak, if uh, it does become necessary to find another job. I like the way Cassio says it. He says, in this new world, the ultimate goal is psychological success, the feeling of pride and personal accomplishment that comes from achieving your most important goals in life. And I think that's where a lot of contemporary employees are. They seek psychological success more than the big corner office with the fancy furniture or the large paycheck. Some people still certainly desire those things and it can feel good to attain some of those things, but I think um, figuring out what psychological success looks like for yourself is important and I think the managerial implication is that it would be important for you as a boss to find out what psychological success looks like for your employees. So that's back to the adage we've mentioned before, know your employees, and this aspect of knowing your employees encompasses finding out where they want to head in life, what psychological success looks like for them, what they aspire to. That leads into another topic that uh, you may never see in a management textbook, but. I think it's probably worth talking about, Some, hopefully somewhat interesting, and I'll try to make sure that it ends up being useful as well. I draw upon the psychoanalytic literature for this. In my studies, I've discovered these concepts called possible selves. So we, according to this framework of thinking, you can agree with it or disagree with it, but it does offer some potential usefulness to put on these lenses for a moment. Uh, the, the topic is possible selves, so if, if you uh, want to think about this for a minute, we all have these different selves that we can think about and um, benefit from. So I'll start with the first self that I'll talk about the least, it's fantasy self. So we all may fantasize about people that we would like to be at some point, and um, I think probably younger people tend to do that more. but. It's always um, kind of an escape to think about these fantasy selves that we could be. And those really probably aren't too important in the workplace, so there's not a whole lot of management implications from that. People who spend too much time thinking about a fantasy self probably would be kind of withdrawn from normal society a bit too much and a little bit unhealthy in their relationships with other people in the outside world. So fantasy self was the first one. Another one is the ought self. There's the feared self, actual self, and ideal self. So I will go back. Let's talk about the ought self a little bit. The ought self is a self-image that we have 
that's mostly been projected onto us by authority figures, maybe our parents, grandparents, maybe uh, other authority figures, maybe our religion. So these would be expectations that have been projected onto us by others. So this is who we feel that we ought to be or ought to become. So it's a lot of those parental messages that we receive. If you have kind of a conscience, a naggy kind of conscience, uh, sometimes that naggy voice that you're hearing, you know, I, I need, should exercise more, I should go to church more, I should be a better parent, I should make more money, I should have had a promotion by now. Some of those could be uh, projections that other people are putting onto you, onto the ought self. So I know of one individual who felt quite a bit of, um, I'll say guilt or a little bit of negative emotion around the fact that his uh, spouse really wanted to be able to stay home with their two young kids and uh, they felt that they didn't, he didn't make sufficient income to allow the spouse to stay home full time with the kids. So there was some ought self, actual self split in that instance that was provoking some uh, guilt on the part of this person, I think mostly unrealistically so, but it was something that this, this uh, individual had to wrestle with. So you might think about what are the, what does your ought self look like and what are those parental or authority figure messages that have been uh, projected onto you. At least you can be aware of those and try to come to grips with those and see if you agree with those messages or not. The next uh, self that I would like to talk about is the feared self, and that is uh, a self that we fear we could become. We're not that person now, but we could become that person. You'll have to think about what your feared self is. It varies, obviously, across individuals. Uh, perhaps maybe there's an alcoholic in one's family, maybe a uh, feared self would be that I might become that also a drug abuser or alcoholic like that other family member. Uh, maybe a feared self about not being able to stay employed and keep a good job or um, any number of things. It, it's a self that um, you think you could become but fear becoming. Uh, the next uh, self is the actual self. So this is how we actually see ourselves. So when we take off the rose-colored glasses, uh, that's slang for when we, when we look at ourselves realistically, not harshly, but not leniently, and kind of consider who we are, that is the actual self-image. And then last, the ideal self. This is who we ideally aspire to become. So this is certainly different from fantasy self. Fantasy self is when we kind of have these fantasies about wanting to fly or be in a uh, rock band or some kind of crazy fantasy that's fun to think about but not realistic. Ideal self is it's much more realistic so it's kind of like who we ideally hope to become, who we aspire to become. One person that I read said that it's kind of like the ideal self is like the North Star. In the old days navigators could use the North Star as a guide point to navigate by. So ideal self kind of functions as a guide for who we want to become, and that interplays with the actual self. So I think the meat of this whole topic comes in here in the sense that if um, you can get to know your employee's ideal self, who they realistically aspire to become, at least that part of their ideal self that involves work, that could be helpful. So it's back to finding out what psychological success looks like for your employees. Who do they ideally want to become as an employee, as a worker, as a manager, as a person? So you may be able to help them to some extent move in the direction of their ideal self. So you don't need to become overly concerned about this. Certainly you have a job to do. There's customers to be served, products to be produced, services to be provided. So we've got all these things to do. But this is just an avenue, another avenue to get to know your employees. The problem is if employees have a big split between their actual self and the ideal self, that's a problem. In fact, I've seen people say that that can even be an indicator of mental ill health or mental anguish. 
So in other words, it can be quite painful when somebody has this ideal self that they are aspiring to become and their actual self is far from that. It um, can be a source of immense stress, it can lead to depression, so it's not a good thing. So to the extent that you can find out what employees want and help them move in the direction of that, you will be seen as a very helpful, very, um, very good boss, actually boss that cares and uh, does what he or she can to uh, help employees uh, manage their career and have a better better life. Um, I do agree with that, that if you have ever experienced a big split between your actual self and the ideal self, it's a pretty painful situation. So definitely it has career and uh, career management implications for you and for your employees. All right, don't want to belabor that, so it's probably a good idea to move on to another topic. Uh, Cassio talks about um, ways that you can uh, mesh employees' interests with the organization's interests, and this goes all the way back to Douglas McGregor, the individual who came up with Theory X, Theory Y, among many other contributions, as well as the hot stove rule, a uh, very big thinker. So I completely agree with this, that anytime you can mesh your employees' interest or who they want to become, where they want to go with what's good for the company, it's a win-win situation. So again, you have to know what employees' goals are, and then if you can look for ways that they can move toward those goals that helps the organization, that can be quite good. So maybe there's certain job assignments or actual jobs people can do that uh, move in the direction they want to go. And if it's a good fit for the company, it's a win-win. Hopefully employees will perform better when they see that they're building some of those skills that they're wanting to build and moving closer to their ideal self or their career goals. So always think about meshing employees' interests, ways that they can reach their goals while helping the organization. would like to uh, talk a little bit about the mentoring this is a huge, uh, a very potentially powerful career development tool. So mentoring is uh, quite helpful. A mentor can be a culture carrier, I think is the term that was used. So a mentor can help a new or relatively young employee um, learn about the organizational culture and how to navigate that culture effectively. So that's quite a big contribution. There's so many lessons that need to be learned to be an effective, wise employee and a good mentor can pass a lot of that on and they can teach new hires the ropes so that's slang for uh, teaching new hires how to navigate through the culture how to avoid pitfalls and problems what to do what not to do how to deal with difficult situations I think it can be tricky though to find a good mentor or to achieve good mentor mentee matches you can refer to the person being mentored as a mentee or a protege whatever is your uh, preference really isn't too important as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there are oftentimes two categories used to describe mentor roles. There's the psychosocial mentoring and the career related mentoring. So a lot of times I think when we think about mentoring, we're thinking of career related mentoring. So that's where the mentor is providing career advice, coaching the employee on how to move up, how to work with a boss, how to be more visible in the organization, how to perform the job where they look more effective. So that would be career-related mentoring. A lot of coaching, a lot of counseling about other positions and how to get ready for those positions, and that can be quite valuable. There's also the psychosocial mentoring, which would focus more on um, meeting, it's back to uh, what we discussed on social support. So it would be the more the emotional support. Um, dealing with some of the psychological needs that a new employee or a less experienced employee has. And I think those are both important, both potentially important. I think the matching process comes in in finding two people, the mentor and mentee, potentially matching up that uh, have, that like each other. Yeah, that certainly would be a good start. Um, you have to have a mentor. I know some companies do, um, I don't want to say forced mentoring, but they implement these programs to make it happen, and that can be good. I think some care needs to be exercised because 
I think the mentor has to be willing, and the mentee has to uh, do some things as well to make the process effective. So too much forcing may not work well. I think it could work well if the company facilitates or nudges this to happen. But um, back to the point, the matching process can be a little bit difficult. So maybe one potential mentee is much more needing the psychosocial mentoring. Maybe they've got a, quite a tough job and uh, maybe a tough boss to work for. And so at this point, they need much more of the psychosocial or social support type mentoring than they do the career related versus another person who's more or less doing fine or might even be uncomfortable with the, so, the emotional support, really doesn't want to do any of the psychosocial mentoring and uh, prefers the career related mentoring. So kind of if you get involved in this as a potential mentee or mentor or a program designer, you might keep in mind that there's different needs that mentors have some, excuse me, the mentees or protégés have different needs and there's different comfort zones or capabilities that potential mentors have. Some might be great at the social support, psychosocial mentoring, not as good at the career related or vice versa. So kind of thinking about the matching process, thinking through it a little more complicated. And I do think uh, it would be wise if you implement a program or for yourself seek out a mentor, do a little bit of research what are the characteristics that make mentees or protégés effective? Let's not put the complete burden on the uh, mentor because certainly there are some uh, behaviors that would make somebody a uh, much better mentee, a much better person to receive more from the mentor. So those would be things to look into and consider. I think uh, it was interesting to switch gears, Cassio mentioned personal characteristics related to low obsolescence, so not going out of date or being obsolete. And uh, I'm wondering if these are personal characteristics you would want to think about. Maybe these are personal characteristics you should develop. They seem pretty reasonable to me. They are high intellectual ability, high self-motivation, and personal flexibility. Personal flexibility is low rigidity. So those might be things that will help you stay up to date in your career and um, things you could think about to self-evaluate. The high intellectual ability, high self-motivation, and personal flexibility or low rigidity. I think most employers and those, most uh, bosses certainly would find those to be um, quite uh, attractive characteristics among their employees. Uh, Casio talks about the uh, characteristics of the first supervisor and says for new employees the first supervisor is critical. I've seen other literature on this that the first job assignment can have huge effects on an employee's career. I'm not uh, pessimistic. I think if you start off with a rough boss or don't do great on your first job assignment there's time to recover in one's career, particularly if you're uh, open to the feedback and do some reflective learning. What could I do different in the future? So kind of learning from the experience, owning up to what you did wrong, being reflective. But certainly I think uh, the first job can have big effects on your future career progress, or on your employee's career progress, and the first supervisor would play a very large role in that. He points out characteristics of the first supervisor that are critical are personally secure, so a boss that is self-secure, has a self-confidence, unthreatened by the new subordinate, and able to communicate company norms. So those would be important things for assigning new employees to supervisors. Can't always do that. Sometimes the new employee has these skills, those are a clear fit to this department. It's not the best boss, but there's no other place for him. But you might keep those in mind if there is some latitude or flexibility on where a new employee could be assigned. Think about the characteristics of the first boss they're going to have. I would add to Cass I could add to Cassio's list. I'm sure you could. We could probably brainstorm a number of characteristics that you would want in the first boss, and feel free to write about those. Um, one that comes to mind to me is a boss that uh, cares about the individual as a human being. Oftentimes you can't uh, know that early on. Um, sometimes you have to assign the new employee to the boss. You don't know if they're going to like each other. 
or how this new supervisor will uh, take to or relate to this new person, but certainly if the boss is somewhat just a little bit more than a boss, somebody that actually cares about the person as a human being, that would send some strong messages, kind of build some underlying feeling of support for this new employee that's probably going to be struggling in many instances to develop and adapt to the world of work or the new organization. So implication is assign new employees to supervisors carefully. I think uh, another point I would like to shift gears toward is uh, on managing careers. Maybe don't uh, force people to move upward in the organization to higher level positions. I mean, if there's a good reason for forcing upward movement, certainly do it if absolutely necessary. But I have done uh, some research in organizations related to careers, and uh, what I found was in one organization I visited that employees, um, I think the organization was stressing career development. I think they had some good um, motives for what they were doing. They were trying to get employees to think about their next position, where they wanted to go. But I know uh, some employees felt pressured to always be thinking, okay, what's my next position? They want me to fill out this report on my career goals, and I'm very happy where I'm at. I'm a very effective employee in my present position. I like my present position. I don't, at this time, aspire to a higher level position. And some of the employees felt um, that was almost regarded negatively to not be saying that you aspired to a higher position. So sometimes those people that aren't necessarily ambitious to move up, but are doing a good job in their current position can be quite valuable. And so kind of keep in mind that uh, not everybody has the same aspirations, but they can still be uh, good organizational contributors. I think uh, this kind of leads into something called the Peter Principle. This is a term probably from the 60s, may even date back to the 1950s. It's kind of a, one of those truisms. Is it a major part of management literature or what you should think about on careers? No, but I thought it was worth mentioning. It's kind of interesting. Um, Peter Principle is that people rise to their level of incompetence. So think about if you've ever seen that. People rise to the level of their incompetence. So in these uh, previous organizations where it was all about starting at a corporation when you were young and then moving up the career ladder for the next 30 or so years, um, the phenomenon related to this was that uh, this one uh, this one individual, Peter, that was uh, observant, noticed that people get promoted. So I'm good in my current position. I get good performance ratings. That helps me get promoted to a higher level position. Again, I get in there, maybe I have to do some learning, eventually master that job. So I'm still within my capabilities. I get promoted again because of my good performance on the second job. And work hard, learn this job. And so I've got the knowledge, abilities, and skills. I've got uh, this intellectual capital that's going to allow me to move up one more time. But sometimes that next promotion exceeds my capabilities. So this isn't capabilities in the sense that can be learned, like with the previous jobs. Yes, when you start a new job, there's that learning period where you have to become effective. But the principle is people rise to their level of incompetence. So at some point, if you keep rising, you're going to hit a position that you can't handle, right? It's a little bit too difficult, too challenging, it's too big for you. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true, especially if you know yourself. We keep talking about know your employees, but I think it is extremely helpful back to the possible selves, knowing your strengths, being reflective, learning from experiences, knowing your interests. Um, I think these things can help us avoid the Peter Principle personally. And certainly we want to make sure that we don't uh, promote employees in, to their level of incompetence, make sure that they're ready for that next level. So I think knowing oneself would be quite important in avoiding the Peter Principle. And I think there are um, career interest inventories that can be useful for employees or maybe for yourself that help you learn what your interests are. There's a number of diagnostics out there, you can do some research talk to experts on that, learn how to figure out where your career, career interests lie, 
One term that I found interested is motivated skills. So you might do some uh, diagnosis of the skills that you enjoy using at work. So we, we all may have a package of skills that we have that we're good at, but there's a subset of those that are called motivated skills. These would be skills that we enjoy using. So you might think about what your skills are that you're not only strong on, but that subset that you really like to utilize on a job, and that may help you figure out which directions you want to go on future jobs. And it might just be another concept, this concept of motivated skills, skills that we enjoy, that we have but enjoy using, might be another uh, concept that will be helpful in learning about your own employees and what they might be most effective and most satisfied in doing as a, both a job and a career.